I thought about putting them on here, but they're already up. Here's the two points. Prayer is need and leave. You got it? So what is prayer? He came back from the dead for you. There is now a love that's stronger than death. That not even death can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm going to introduce you to uh, Pastor Craig Brown. Uh, Pastor Craig uh, is not... It's not the first time he's been here in South Florida with our church, but I think it's the first time he's preached. Is that right? Have you preached here before? I can't remember. Yeah, so I think this is the first time, but he's a good and long friend of, uh, and long in time frame because they're both really old, Pastor John and Craig are. They've been friends for a long time. Um, and uh, he lives in Nashville. So he came down from Nashville to be with us. And like I said earlier, he did the uh, praying through the word uh, yesterday, and that was great. I mean, we were talking about it before church for those that were here, uh, talking about how uh, how rich and fulfilling and what a blessing it was for all that were there. So really grateful for that. But most importantly about Craig is that he's a brand new grandfather, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so his family's growing and he doesn't have to, you know, take all that much responsibility in, in, in this one. You know, that's great. So, but we want to pray for him as he comes and brings the word today. It's going to be out of the gospel of John chapter two. And so just join me as I pray for him and he comes up and leads us. Father, I pray for our time of being in the word. This is you speaking to us. These are your words for us today. And so Lord, unplug our ears and open up our hearts. And help our minds to comprehend all that you would have for us. And we're grateful for Pastor Craig, grateful that you would use him to bring your word to us. We don't want to leave this place the same people that we walked in. We want to be transformed by your word. And so we pray that you would do that and help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Chris. That's... Uh... It's, it's great being here, and I think, I mean, so far, it's great to be a grandfather. Uh, I, you know, I've been told if, if I knew that it was so great to be a grandfather, I would have done that one first. So, you know, but so far, so good, and so it's pretty great. We, um, John and I, months back, scheduled a time for him to go out of town and for me to come into town, and I said, I can just stay if you want. You can just stay gone. He's like, no, I love my people too much. I said, well, I love them too. I'll just come on back in, so... I'm, I'm really honored to be with you all tonight, and um, I, I feel a, a real affinity um, with, with you guys, even though it's only been a few times. But it was just a couple months ago, I think, when, when I was here last, and we, had a, we played the escape game with some of the leaders. Um, I, we got out. Our, our team got out, at least. So, you know, we're here again, and uh, shared a great meal together, and then had some time during the, the next day just to kind of plan the future of New City. So... Uh, I'm honored to be here. The biggest honor that I have, quite, quite honestly, is this, is that we get to actually look at the Word of God together, right? Like, it's one thing to come into a church, but to actually open up a, a book and go, this is something that God could have for us this very evening, it's a sacred honor, right? And very few of us actually come into a place, myself included, thinking, wait, God may actually meet me in a profound way that I didn't expect tonight. And so that's, that's, that's our prayer. That's our hope. Is that when we walk out of here, just like Chris prayed, that we'd be different people. We'd be like, I don't know what just happened, but the Spirit of Christ somehow captured me. And that's my prayer. And uh, I've got people in Nashville who are praying for our time together tonight as well. Um, and so we're going to look at the book of John. It's a letter that Jesus' best compadre, his closest friend, uh, wrote some years after his passing. If, do you have a Bible? Are the words going to be on the screen, brothers? I don't know how... They're on this, look at that. This is great. Um, but here's the context for this. This is the very first public miracle that Jesus does. It, it's like his calling card. It's like what he's doing coming out of the gates. He's like, okay, this is going to tell you who I'm really am going to be. He's 30 years old. He's been around for a while. But now all of a sudden he's coming in public. And he's pulling his calling card out. He goes, this is who I'm going to be. And what this shows us is actually something that is going to hopefully get us at the deepest recesses of who we are. 
because it's, it's Jesus saying, this is who I am. So let's read along these words uh, from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, about Jesus' first miracle. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, they don't have any wine. What has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? Jesus asked. My hour has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. Now six stone jar, water jars had been set there for the Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And they did. When the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called the groom and told him, everyone sets out the fine wine first. Then, after people are drunk, the inferior. But you have kept the fine wine until now, which coincidentally is where we get the term saving the best for last. That's where that comes from. Jesus did this. The first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Spirit, we ask that you would meet us, that you would teach us, and that you would form us. Uh, you're the power that raised Christ from the dead. And so we ask that you would do that in our lives, even as we've sung already. Amen. So I'll let you know a little secret. A little secret is whenever someone goes somewhere as a guest preacher, there's this temptation that's always kind of in the back of your mind. And here's the temptation. I could go in there and just kind of drop a bomb. <laughs> and then I'm going to sneak back out of town and somebody else got to clean it up. Just kind of like shift things around a little bit, right? Like there's an old saying, uh, now you've gone from preaching to meddling. You ever heard that? Preacher, now you've gone from preaching to meddling. So let me just go ahead and throw one out there to you, okay? How's your prayer life? How's your, how's your prayer life? Uh-oh. Now you've gone to meddling. And I'll promise you this. The only meddling, the only shifting around, shaking I want to do tonight is this. As we look at these words together, my prayer is that everything else gets shaken out and what we find are just a few nuggets of gold. A few nuggets that change our lives that we actually become people who say like, we can just say, I've got a prayer life. It's not even about, do I have a great prayer life? or I've got a prayer life. I'm in communion with the divine one. We were talking yesterday morning, um, in, right now in America, this may surprise you, 91% of Americans actually believe there's a spiritual realm. You may be one of them. Most likely, most of you in this room would believe there's a spiritual realm. There's an invisible realm of some sort. The question is always, how do we connect into that realm? And this passage, although it doesn't, it's not specifically about prayer, it actually teaches us the very heart of prayer that Jesus says, this is how you connect into the divine realm. This is how you connect to God. This is how you connect to the one who made everything, and in fact, made each one of us for himself. That's what we're going to do today. Now, I'm going to, this sermon has two points. There you go. I think you can remember them. If you want to, you can get a pencil or pen and write them down. I thought about putting them on here, but they're already up. Here's the two points. Prayer is need and leave. You got it? So what is prayer? See, you got it. Now we can leave. You've got it. You've got the, okay, what is prayer? That's all prayer is. But it's all prayer is is to need and to leave. Look at the first thing Mary says. In verse 3, what does she do? She comes with her need, and here's the need. They have no wine. There's a theologian, his name is Ole Halsby. He's a Norwegian guy. He's been dead for several centuries. I read dead people. Sometimes they help me. And here's what he said. He says this, To pray is nothing more involved than to let Jesus into your need. To pray is nothing more than to let Jesus into your need. Do you see what, Jesus, what Mary's doing here? They have no wine. There's a need. Now, you, 
have, have you, who's heard this story before? Have any of you guys heard this story? Yeah, see, most of us have at least heard this story. We've probably heard sermons out of it. You guys probably had sermons out of it this year or two, last couple of years maybe. I don't know. But here's the thing. All she does is come and go, they've got no wine. It's a big deal. Our weddings that we have, have you guys ever been to a really nice wedding? I went to a wedding one time. My wife's from Los Angeles. I'm telling you what, Los Angeles weddings, like Beverly Hills weddings, <laughs> I went to a wedding one time. I was like, golly, how much money they must have spent in this thing, right? Okay, that ain't nothing compared with these. This, in, these in this era, everybody in the village would have come. Everybody in the city would have come. They would have gone for week, days, not weeks, but days. And they'd have this party. And if you ran out of food and drink, eh, big social faux pas. It brought shame and disgrace upon your family. There's certain cultures in which if, you, if something like that happens, your family name just drops immediately. So that's the situation. There's a pretty big need here. A lot of weakness, helplessness. What are we going to do with this? And immediately, Jesus just says, come to me. And Mary says, they have no wine. Now, if we bring our need to Jesus, there's immediately a problem. And here's the problem. We like to be strong. I don't like to, come to, I don't like to go anywhere weak, do you? I like to get my act together. I like to go in places, getting it all, I'm there, right? And there's two things that immediately show when it comes to the spiritual realm that I'm actually relying upon my own strength. And the first one is this, is that I'll try to convince God that he should do something. The second one is that I'll actually sometimes, and I want to be very careful saying this, I'll command God to do something. Now let's look. When Mary comes, she's not trying to convince Jesus to do something. She's not trying to build a case, is she? All she says is, they have no wine. I have this need. I have a need. You know, Mary doesn't come and she doesn't say, hey, these are our best friends and these people are such good people. And you know, they've known you, Jesus, by the way, since before you were born. And he's kind of going like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, she's not doing that, is she? She's not trying to convince them. She's not trying to build a case. She doesn't say, you know what? Think of the disgrace that's going to come upon these guys. And since we're best friends, maybe even relatives, it's going to come upon us too. She doesn't build any of that case, does she? She just comes and presents a need. How about me? How about you? If we start thinking about prayers, just voicing my need, one of my biggest problems is I want to try to build a case to convince God to do something for me. And it might sound something like this. You know, I've been doing things pretty well. I've been doing the good stuff. I've been faithful. Now, sometimes, you, right? This is hard because we may not say those words, but you ever find yourself going like, wait, I've been cleaning up my act. Why is everything going bad all of a sudden? See, we're building a case. We're trying to convince him. There's something here that needs a change. Or I've got thousands of people praying for me now. We've got a huge prayer movement going. And so, come on, God, now you're going to listen and do something, aren't you? Or if you bail me out of this one, I'll give you my life. I'll serve you forever. Ever thought, said, out loud or silently, felt any of those things before? All that is is coming to God from a position of strength, saying, like, I can somehow convince you. But you know, here's the thing. Jesus doesn't respond to our attempts to convince him. As if if we just twist his arm enough, he'll give in and go, okay, all right, all right, fine, you got me. <laughs> you got me finally. Okay, yeah, I'll do what you want. He doesn't respond to that, does he? And sometimes people think, actually, if you read people who study the scriptures, they call commentate, they're called commentators. Sometimes they'll say, well, look what Mary does. She kind of twists the knife on him. Do you see Mary saying, hey, Jesus, really? Let's do this now. No, she doesn't do that. And she also has the opportunity to command. Think about this. She could come in, and we kind of think of it more like instructing or directing. Like, Jesus needs a little help, by the way. Remember this. The one who spoke all things into existence out of nothing in a second? Like, he needs a little direction from me. <laughs> okay, here's the way you probably would want to do something like this. Um, I can hear Mary thinking, like, hey, you know, why don't you send Matthew and Judas and James down the street to the market and get some wine. And while you're there, pick up some more bread and some lamb too. 
and you come on back with it, okay? Now you hurry on now, y'all, come on. Or, hey, I am your mother. But is that what she does? Well, how about me? How about you? What might we do to try to kind of instruct, direct, command, heal her now? Lord, fix my spouse. My girlfriend, my boyfriend, they, they are not what they need to be. Change them. Do you hear that? Everything will be okay. If you'll just fix this, then it's all okay. And we start trying to direct Jesus. We start trying to direct the traffic. We try to start telling him, here's what really needs to happen. But here's the deal. Jesus doesn't respond to our commands and our direction. He's, his last name is not Alexa. His last name is not Siri. We don't give demands and all of a sudden it's like, boom, there it is, right? And you know what happens when we live this way? You might call it the result of all this is prayer fatigue. If you, if you find yourself now, if you can answer the question, you know, what do you, how's your prayer life? And you go, uh, terrible. You know what? I'll just go ahead and tell you what's going on is you and I have prayer fatigue at that point. And here's what prayer fatigue looks like. Somehow, if I do it right, God will respond to my prayer. And when he doesn't give me what I want, then I lose hope, I lose heart, I lose faith, I lose joy, I lose energy, I lose motivation. And it's just like, eh. Can you relate to any of that? Do you ever go there? Maybe you're there now. I want to try something. I want you to think about a need. Maybe it's something, it's a, it's a, maybe it's something that deals with your past. Maybe it's something that deals with your future. Maybe it's something you've never, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'm not going to ask you to volunteer or anything, I promise. Maybe it's something you've never told anybody else. Something that's deep and a need in, your, in the recesses of your being. Would you actually just be able to express it as maybe in one word? Maybe not even a word. Just give that need to Jesus right now silently? That's the first step of prayer. And you know the problem is most of us just can't go there. Take a second. Literally, I'll give, I'll give you 15 seconds right now. This may be really awkward for some of us. Take 15 seconds, just silently, and just present a need to Jesus. Try that. So there's a need. Let's look at what Mary does next. Look at verse 5, if you have it there. She just leaves it. I love it. She turns around to all the servants. She's like, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> do whatever he tells you. See, what she actually is doing there, this idea of leaving it, is she believes that he'll do something good. She believes he'll actually know what to do in that situation. She, she actually believes that he can and will do what's best. That she, she trusts Jesus even when he's being kind of rude to her, to be quite honest. He's, he calls her woman. By the way, um, if you have a mom, let me just go ahead and tell you now, if you call her woman, the next sentence, the next week or year or lifetime of yours will not go well. And Jesus turns to her and he some of the commentators who translate, they try to be real kind of nice. Uh, hey, mom. No, he actually turns to this woman. So even when there's a sense of that this might bug him, even with the kind of what seems like it could be rudeness even, she still goes, hey, you know what? I don't know what he'll do. I don't know when he'll do it. I don't know how he'll do it. I'm just going to leave the need with him. She's never seen him turn water into wine. She's never seen anybody turn water into wine, neither of you and I. Who would have thought it? Who would have thunk like, oh yeah, I can tell you, I'll just tell him this, and you know he's going to do, he's going to get all these barrels and jars everywhere, and we're going to party for another week? She would have never thought it. All she knows is we got a problem. Houston, we have a problem. They have no more wine, and she leaves it with him. She leaves it up to him to find a way. Think about your life for a minute. If you, 
and I took this on. We said, you know what? I'm just going to start presenting needs in my own life. We'll call that prayer. I'm going to see needs in other people's life. We'll call that intercession. And I'm just going to present the need to Jesus, and I'm going to leave it with him. How much freer do you think you would be? How, think about it emotionally. How, how much more time in the day, if you and I were able to stop worrying about what was going to happen in the future, and we just left it in the hands of somebody who actually loved us, what could that look like? Does that sound appealing to you at all? When I stop just a few minutes tonight and say that, I go, oh, that would be awesome. That would be really great to be able to have someone that I could trust. And she knew that Jesus was never at a loss to know what to do. So look what she says next. Look what she does next. Nothing. After verse 5, Mary drops out of the picture. They have no wine. Do whatever he tells you. And then she's gone. That's prayer. That's prayer. How hard is that? That's not hard. Jesus, I don't know if my daughter is going to be able to carry this baby to term. Do what you'll do. Jesus, I don't know if I can ever get clean from these, these habits and these patterns and lusts that I have. I'll leave it to you. Jesus, I don't know if we're going to find a new building. I'll leave it to you. Jesus, I don't know if I can keep going on this way. And I'll leave it with him. You see, it's that hard, but it's that easy. And guess what happens when we do that? He actually comes in and meets us. We've done our part. And then we leave it with him. And we just let Jesus take over. I had the sobering privilege and responsibility of walking with two different people, two different men, uh, both middle-aged men, who were diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Both of these men were followers of Jesus. One of the men, uh, we'll call him Randy, and Randy believed God would heal him now. In fact, he claimed healing. Randy literally got thousands of people to start praying for him online. It's amazing what you can do online, how many you can generate so much interest in something so quickly, right? He had thousands of people praying for him online. Um, and he died. That's Randy. John, on the other hand, John also was a follower of Christ, and he believed God would heal him. And he didn't know if it was going to be now or next week, or for eternity. And he asked people to pray for him, too. And he also meditated on Hebrews chapter 11. You ever heard of Hebrews chapter 11? The book of Hebrews chapter 11 is called the Hall of Fame of Faith. And it's this amazing passage. And I actually knew, both these guys knew each other, and the three of us would spend time together. It was so fascinating to walk through this, like, beautiful, awful time with both of them, Right? And here's what we learn from John. John said, in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, we're told things like this. Some of them were sawn in two. Others were cut in half. Others were crucified. Others were left and abandoned in the desert and died. Others were raised from the dead. Others received back their the children from the dead. Other people found what they were looking it, It's like, wait a minute. you got some people who have this, what happens to them is this. Others, what happens to them is this. This is, seems really bad. This seems really good. But all of them are living by faith. God, here's my need. I'll leave it in your hands. Do whatever he tells you. Now, Here's the question. We could end it now, and if we walked out of here right now, every, hopefully we all go, okay, I've got needs, I'm going to present them to God. And I'm just going to leave them with him. But here's the thing. Why would we ever do that? 
how can we know that he'll actually be good to us and for us? How do we know when we have these things going on inside of us that he actually will care for us? And the answer is given in the very last verse here, and that is this, that this was the first of Jesus' signs. Did you see that? It's a sign. Now, what's a sign? When I was driving over here this evening, earlier, or earlier this afternoon, I saw a sign that said, New City Fellowship meets here. Now, is the sign New City Fellowship? No. This is New City Fellowship. The sign points to something that's just a real or real. The truth, the reality is this. You are New City Fellowship. The sign just says, this is what you're looking for right here. And that's when the word is, sign is used. That's what it's saying. This points to a real or something. There's a reality that this is pointing us towards. What you're really looking for is inside the building. It's not out there. It's in here. And so this thing that Jesus does, as amazing as it is, it's a sign pointing to a greater reality. That greater reality is the rest of his life. It's the first sign he does. And so it's pointing for the rest of his ministry, the rest of his life, this is what it's all about. It's a symbol. It's a picture of something that's more important, something that's more real, something that's more substantial. And so when we get that, all of a sudden we go, okay, now what? Look at these three key things that are here. The first one, he says, it's not my hour. Okay? Throughout the book of John, and you're going to look at, when you do the I Am series coming up, that'll be a lot of the book of John. Nate, was it you saying that you were, or Nat, was it you saying that you were looking in John recently? Oh, Chris, that was you? Yeah. Getting ready for the series, aren't you? <laughs> well, throughout the book of John, you're going to come across this term, my hour. And my hour always refers to something, and that is the death of Jesus. He's like, my hour's not yet come. He says, it's not, it's not my time yet. Why are you trying to show me up? Why are you trying to say it's my time? I, I'm not ready to do the ultimate miracle yet. That's essentially what's going on here. And he's talking about his death. It's not my hour yet. So when you go into the book of John, ever just be looking for this word hour. Some, some translations will say my time. The CSB will say my hour. And then think about this. What does he provide? He provides wine. He doesn't provide milk and cookies. He doesn't just give them some more water. And notice what else he doesn't do. He doesn't take the empty casks all the flasks that would have the wine in them and just refill them, he actually gets these jars. There are six jars, and we're told they're ceremonial washing jars that would normally be full of water, that people would come into the wedding feast or into a religious ceremony, and they would do a certain type of washing with their hands, their feet, their heads, and that was how you got clean to come into the place because you got to remember, this is a very it's a dirty culture. And you're coming into the presence of other people and into the God of all gods for worship in a wedding service like this. And so there's a cleansing that has to happen. And what he's actually doing is saying, there's a cleansing that's even bigger than what you're doing. There's a cleansing that's bigger than the water that's going to be in these, in these uh, casks. There's actually these ritual, these ritual stone, they're huge. This would have been 150 gallons of wine, guys. That's a lot. That's like 750 bottles of wine you could buy in the store here. That's a lot of wine. Why would he do that? Well, throughout the Bible, we we'll also read this, is that wine is paralleled to blood. And blood is paralleled to wine. And what Jesus is doing is saying, there's something coming that will not only bring you great joy, it will also bring you purification it will also bring you presence with me. There's two things going on here, and the first one is this. Jesus is by doing this showing that you have access, we have access to him. That we actually can come into his presence in a way of saying whatever is on our hearts. And to know you'll be accepted. Which is the second one. We not only have access, we're also accepted. What does Jesus think of you right now? If you're, if you're, whether you're a follower of Christ or not, 
you've never seen Jesus. What do you think his face towards you is right now, his countenance? How does he feel about you? Here's what I've, as I've looked through these words for years now, here's what I finally realized. This tells me for sure that when he looks at me, he sees he's ravished with me. He's captivated by me. And I'm like, what? He actually wants, this sound, I want to be very careful, he wants his people. Do you know what the image is that we're called? The church, the people who follow Christ are called his bride. It's a wedding. He's providing a celebration and a purity and a cleansing through his blood. So now he looks at you. If you're a follower of Christ today, he looks at you and says, I can't believe myself. You're beautiful. When God the Father looks at his people, because of the death of Jesus for us, you know what he sees? How the loveliness and beauty of Jesus. That's what he looks at you and sees that now. How does that change the way you want to pray? Here's the reality. I'll, let's just be straight. I go, I, that's not really me. I don't, yeah, I don't do that. That's not me. He can't, no. The prophets would say it like this The Lord your God is with you, He's mighty to save, He takes great delight in you. He takes great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He cherishes you. He rejoices over you with singing. You ever been serenaded? Anybody ever been serenaded? Ooh, no one? Uh, It's awkward and wonderful all at once. (laughs) Imagine the only true beauty. Imagine what you most want and desire is it's another person, another being, and then multiply out to the nth degree and imagine that one is actually looking at you and rejoicing over you as singing today. And you say, how do I know? Because he died for you. That's how much. He came back from the dead for you. There is now a love that's stronger than death, that not even death can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. A few things as we walk out of here, what would change us in this? One is this. There is no concern of us of ours now that is not also a concern of his. Anything that's going on in you, anything in your heart, your mind, can actually be presented to him, and he will not shame you. Apostle Paul says in Philippians, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Just tell him. And then you can leave it with him. And when you go, I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know if he heard me. I don't know. I think I'll probably keep trying to direct traffic. I'm going to try to direct Jesus, command him, convince him a little more that he should help me here. Instead, you can just leave it. If you have a need, leave it with him. And then know that in the cross of Jesus, you have cleansing acceptance, and you also are captivating to him and cherished by him. So that's prayer. Need, leave. Let's do it.